Lord, we give thanks to you again for the the greatness of the salvation you provided for us in Christ, the fact that that which you have secured for us, you will complete. We think about the nature of what we're going to have to wrestle through this morning regarding the the false teachers, and I think about some of the identities that Peter attributes toward them being spots and blemishes, and the very nature of your bride is that we will be cleansed, we will be spotless and without blame because of the work of Christ in and through us. And so we rejoice in your kindness and we rejoice in your salvation and ask that you would produce in us even now um, hearts of proper thanksgiving and worship and cultivate lives of holiness and joy. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together as, a, as an assembly, as a church body, to, to recognize and affirm these things and to, to sing about them as we've done, as we've testified through our uh, mutual affirmation and singing and um, as we've uh, affirmed through praying together and as we have seen in the, the scriptures through the Psalms already. And with that, I, I rejoice in your um, testimony that you've provided through David. He he drew so much from a range of things that you uh, chose to articulate through him and, and others as well, truths of the scriptures about you and your engagement with people, even even uh, soliciting a proper response, not not just a, or a proper perspective, not just that you are our refuge and salvation and strength, but in view of that, it's a curious thing that you would even give attention to man. Um, we are but frail and fragile and passing. You're eternal and good and enduring and magnificent, and yet you do um, give attention to, to the individual. To, to peoples, to, to nations, and to, so we, we give thanks to you, Lord, uh, for the, the kindness and the, the, the range of your care and how it expresses itself and that all those who have submitted in faith to you can join David in the testimony that this is, there's blessing in that. Um, it may or may not express itself in immediate um, tangible things uh, as, as was expressed in the Psalms, it may just be that we have the fruit of the Spirit, that, that we have lives of, of hope and expectation and purpose. Uh, so those things are uh, invaluable in so many ways, and we're, we rejoice in that. We do pray for Peru, and thank you for um, growing your church um, in this nation, and uh, how in your providence you have given them uh, a variety of circumstances and challenges, but the, through these things, you have demonstrated yourself faithful. You have kept your people. You have grown your church. We pray that you would continue to grow and strengthen your church and that, um, that uh, you would uh, make much of your name through these things. And we do pray for their peace. I thank you that they've had a measure of stability these last uh, several years and that um, perhaps uh, less than we would prefer in some ways and and more than we know to, to appreciate in others, but it does bring to our attention the, 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 fr the fragile nature of peace. Um, the nations filled with sinners are always anxious to lead, to, uh, to lead with power, to lead corruptly, to lead for selfish reasons. And so it is an incredible mercy that we have known as much um, peace as we have experienced, and we do pray that you continue to afford us uh, measure peace so that um, as we pray about the, the training needs and the discipleship needs and the evangelistic needs of Peru, we would be able to send people out because we're able to invest in these things as much as we are. And help us to steward that in a way that, that honors you, uh, to be good students and stewards of the scriptures and to live lives that are faithful and pleasing to you and confident in you. And we do ask for help, Lord, as we engage um, this uh, just less than um, exciting and less than um, it, the nature of those who assault your church is a necessary discussion. Um, uh, but it's not something that uh, we ever want to take special joy in. And outside of the fact that you keep your church, that you are greater um, than he who is in this world, um, but help us, Lord, not to develop our own expression of pride, um, that uh, we're not like these false teachers. Well, but by your grace, are we not like them? Uh, we're all prone to drift. We're all prone toward um, uh, 
a failure. And Lord, we want to be kept. I, I think even about the example of Balaam that we'll, we'll, we'll give significant attention to. And if we just took part of his story, um, there might be things to say, well, isn't that a, isn't that a great guy? But he didn't finish, and uh, his finish reflected his real heart. And none of us here have finished, um, and we know of others who didn't finish well. Um, Lord, we want, we want your help to finish well. Um, and that means running well now. Um, so, Lord, preserve your church and keep us. Um, help me to be careful with my tone um, regarding things that um, I regard as personal offense, uh, as they insult and assault your church, but... Um, I want to be careful with my own tone. I want to be careful about uh, how we address things that are sometimes hard for um, for one another to hear. Um, and I pray there would be charity if, if there's disagreement with uh, my perspective and conclusions that we would love one another to uh, recognize that this is we're, we're laboring in the scriptures and we're working hard to understand and we're willing to re-engage and, and to think about them better. Lord, we need help, and so grant us the, give us the grace of humility um, and, and to, to, to do these things in a way that please you. We do thank you, again, that you have redeemed your people, you will keep your people, you will accomplish your purposes, and, and that includes um, safeguarding it from those who would assault it. We give thanks to you, in Jesus' name. So we're going to be continuing our work in 2 Peter chapter 2 this morning. Um, but I want to begin by refreshing your memory about Balaam, um, who Peter used as an example of the uh, offense and character of the false teacher. Now, uh, several weeks ago, and I don't remember how many weeks ago, I just remember drawing from it, so I don't expect you to, to have maybe, maybe the same recollection of this, but several weeks ago we made reference to Balaam's experience more broadly. Uh, we highlighted his role as a prophet for hire who ultimately did not fulfill his charge to curse Israel, but rather repeatedly blessed them. And if we just took that, we're like, wow, what a, what a weird but great guy. Um, because, you know, he, he went on to, to go out of his way um, after being fired. He continues to bless Israel. But there was more to this man's story, as we will see, and as you're likely familiar the things that are helpful to draw out for us. So once more, the backdrop of Balaam's story is that Israel was approaching the promised land. They had um, experienced the, the magnificent deliverance out of Egypt. They had their uh, the tragic circumstances that produced a necessary 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. But they're finally at the, the, the very edge of the promised land. And they had recently engaged in a military conflict in which they had absolute and decisive victories. They, they weren't picking fights, but they didn't back down, and the Lord gave them magnificent victories. And after this, they continued their progress toward the land, and this put them in dangerous proximity to Moab, whose king, Balak, was terrified. And we can be sympathetic to that. So you have this mass of people who have been supernaturally preserved, and they have come out of Egypt, and we know the testimony preceded them, because when you get to Jericho, they're melting in fear. They've just defeated your neighbors, and now they're at your doorstep. So Balak was terrified. So he wanted to soften up Israel before an anticipated conflict by hiring Balaam to curse them. So if I'm going to have to engage him, at least maybe make them a more reasonable, um, uh, softer target to have to engage. So there was some negotiation between Balak's men and Balaam, and it appeared that Balaam was declining the offer as Yahweh had forbidden him to go and curse Israel. So Balaam, can we hire you to, to curse Israel? And then, no, back and forth, back and forth. And, and, sorry, guys, I can't. But then he ultimately does go. But with the understanding that he's restricted to speak only what Yahweh allows him, which precludes any cursing of Israel. So, yes, you can go, but you're not going to curse Israel. And while on his way, he has the following experience as recorded in Numbers chapter 22, verses 22 through 35. But God was angry because Balaam was going, and the angel of Yahweh took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. Now he was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of Yahweh standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, the donkey turned off from the way and went into the field. But Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back into the way. Then the angel of Yahweh stood in a narrow path of the vineyards, with a wall on this side and a wall on that side. When the donkey saw the angel of Yahweh, she pressed herself to the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. 
the angel of Yahweh went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn to the right hand or the left. When the donkey saw the angel of Yahweh, she lay down under Balaam. So Balaam was angry and struck the donkey with his stick. And Yahweh opened the mouth of the donkey. And she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? Then Balaam said to the donkey, Because you have made a mockery of me. If there had been a sword in my hand, I would have killed you by now. The donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey in which you have ridden all your life to this day? Have I ever been accustomed to do so to you? And he said, No. Then Yahweh opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of Yahweh standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, and he bowed all the way to the ground. The angel of Yahweh said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out as an adversary, because your way was contrary to me. But the donkey saw me and turned aside from me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, I would, have surely, I would surely have killed you just now and let her live. Balaam said to the angel of Yahweh, I have sinned, for I did not know that you were standing in the way against me. Now then, if it is displeasing to you, I will turn back. But the angel of Yahweh said to Balaam, Go with the men, but you shall speak only the word which I tell you. So Balaam went along with the leaders of Balak. Now that was quite a memorable engagement. Uh, a lot of us have had a ver variety of experiences, but I think that probably was unique among all of our experiences, something that we likely would be like, you'll never guess what happened to me this time. So, I mean, quite a memorable experience. And a lot of even the kids are like, I know this story because it just stands out. But we need to back up for just a moment and consider a little more carefully what led up to this moment. So we note that in verses 20 and 21, it states, God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men have come to call you, rise up and go with them, but only the word which I speak to you shall you do. So Balaam arose in the morning and saddled his donkey and went with, his, the, went with the leaders of Moab. So again, looking at context, God came to Balaam and gave him permission. Right? We're following that. And yet the very next verse that sets up the peculiar engagement of Balaam's donkey saving his life and living to tell the tale herself starts with, but God was angry because Balaam was going, and the angel of Yahweh took his stand against him. Now, aside from Balaam's donkey talking to him, how many of you, please don't show hands, we don't want to just, I can catch enough, how many of you are a little confused about what's happening here? That God gave Balaam permission to go and was then angry enough to kill him over it, but yet gracious enough to allow his donkey to intervene. That's a really peculiar story, isn't it? It's not just about the fact the donkey's mouth was open. It's a little confusing when we see only this moment. And I'm grateful for that, not simply so that we can unpack an interesting moment, but the, so you'll see the complexity and deep-rooted wicked motivation of one who will soon be revealed to be a false prophet. Because like Balaam, the false teacher's actions and words usually have a, a veil of complexity to them. Not because the person is conflicted in their sin so much as it is that they're playing their hand as shrewdly as possible, ultimately driven by wicked motivations. And at the same time, Balaam may have been self-deceived too, um, not appreciating the force of the drive of his own carnal motivations. And sin does this. You recognize that, right? It literally will drive people mad. Maybe not functionally mad, but mad. It erodes one's capacity to act rationally, leading Peter to, to reference such persons as being like wild animals, as he states here in our passage. But these, like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, blaspheming where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed. And here I also think of the, the young man in Proverbs as he's being seduced. And we're, we're told, look at this guy, watch, you can see what's happening. A moment that would only require him to take one step outside of his immediate context to see he was being lured to death. We read, suddenly he follows the adulterous woman as an ox goes to the slaughter or as one in fetters to the discipline of a fool until an arrow pierces through his liver as a bird hastens to the snare so he does not know that it will cost him his life. But what of Balaam's context? Well, we're introduced to him um, in the context of his being recruited for the cursing of Israel. 
So he obviously has some kind of reputation or some kind of context in which it could be known that if you hire this man, he has this potential to, to curse other people. A matter that he in some measure and in some way took, um, and so he's hired to curse Israel, and that was specifically the context in which he in some form took up with God. So he, Lord, uh, am I clear to do this one? Am I good for this hire? And he was plainly told what? No. Right? So he was plainly told what? No. Absolutely. You will not curse my people. That's very, very clear. God said to Balaam, do not go with them. Okay, are, we, are we clear on this so far? Do not go with them. You shall not curse the people for they are blessed. Balaam got the message and says no to the request. But then comes the follow-up. Maybe the follow-up in certain circumstances would be, Daddy said no, let me go ask Mommy. But here comes the follow-up, and this is important to his context and to what Peter speaks to in his letter. Then Balak sent, and that's uh, the king of Moab, Balak, again sent leaders more numerous and more distinguished than the former. They came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak, the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I beg you, hinder you from coming to me, for I will indeed honor you richly, and I will do whatever you say to me. Please come then, curse this people for me. Balaam replied to, the, replied to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not do anything, either small or great, contrary to the command of Yahweh, my God. Now please, you also stay here tonight, and I will find out what else Yahweh will speak to me. Do you see what just happened? You might be like, oh, that, what a pious guy. But let's look at what happened. There was promises of wealth and good fortune, to which he responds with a really kind of a perspective of sweetening of the offer himself, although he would have filled the house with gold and silver. Let me check. Let me check. You know, Yahweh just said, no, don't go, and no, you can't do this. But let me go check with Yahweh, and, and I'll get back to you. What's changed? Only financial prospects has changed. And it was in this context that God tells him, sure, you go. But only the word which I speak to you shall you do. And soon thereafter, what was already stated with absolute clarity at the first inquiry of this matter was driven home in an intensely dramatic manner. And the Lord was so patient in speaking to Balaam because I would have probably phrased the allowance to go as follows. Again, this is my rewrite. I want to be careful and clear on that. So my, my less than, um, well, this is my version. I've already made myself clear, Balaam. But yeah, go ahead and go, you money-grubbing pervert. <laughs> but know this, you will not curse my people. Now, again, that might sound a little dramatic, um, and that's not how I rebuke my children or others. <laughs> but money-grubbing pervert, that's... Whoa, where did you get that? <laughs> did Balaam offend you at some point in time? Well, he did, but it was in this context. That's a little harsh, and it's certainly not stated that way in any of our translations that I'm aware of. Um, So it's fair to, so is that a fair way to speak about Balaam? Because does Balaam not go on to bless Israel multiple times? Yeah, not a true question on that one. He does. And one extensive expression of blessing after being fired by Balak. Balak says, you know what? I would have given you this, and you blew it. Just get out of here. And Balaam says, I got one more. And he just goes on to thoroughly bless Israel and provide prophecy that was quite accurate. So that's true, but it's also not the end of his story. The end of his story comes in Numbers chapter 31, where we read of his being killed by Israel. But why did they kill Balaam? Well, Peter tells us, because he was not only Balaam, son of Beor, but Balaam, son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Now, if you're reading from the the Net Bible, the New English Translation Bible, or even the King James Version, not even the New King James, but the original King, or the older King James, this was driven home even more plainly, as he is referenced to Balaam, son of Bosser. And the reason for that is there's a textual variant here. It might even be in some of your footnotes. So there's a textual variant, and basically all that means is there's a word used in some of the credible Greek manuscripts, and some of them it's not. So we sometimes have words that we're not sure which always was the scribal decision. Don't worry about, does that challenge the scriptures? It doesn't. It just sometimes is more clear and plain, and sometimes people in good scholarship have to wrestle through these things. 
But one of the conclusions about this variant word is that it may have been a wordplay. And Peter actually does this throughout chapter 2. I don't have, uh, I'm not spending the time and I don't necessarily have the, the skill level I'd prefer to, to draw that out. It's not necessary, but he does wordplays every so often um, in terms of just going, to going back and forth to, to fl fill out and um, complete the language more um, skillfully. But it may have been a Hebrew term expressing flesh. So Peter may have been retitling him as Balaam, the son of the flesh, or the son of carnality. So whichever title proves to be best, we plainly see that Yahweh shamed Balaam through his donkey and made it beyond perfectly clear, you do not curse my people. And it appeared he got the message, right? It appeared that way. But he also apparently got the message of a nice fat payment for services rendered in the weakening of God's people. So while he did not overtly declare a curse on Israel, we find out just why it was that Israel put him to death. Numbers 31 verse 16, Behold, these women caused the sons of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against Yahweh in the matter of pure. So the plague was among the congregation of Yahweh. So what was this incident Moses referred to here? It's what followed Balaam's apparent good conduct toward Israel. Feeling the, the tug of the purse, he gave counsel for Israel being seduced into profound shame and judgment. We read this in Numbers chapter 25, verses 1 through 9. While Israel remained at Shittim, the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. For they invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel joined themselves to Baal of Peor. And Yahweh was angry against Israel. Yahweh said to Moses, Take all the leaders of the people and execute them in broad daylight before Yahweh. So the fierce anger of Yahweh may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to the judges of Israel, Each of you slay his men who have joined themselves to Baal of Peor. Then behold, one of the sons of Israel came and brought to his relatives a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the sons of Israel while they were weeping at the doorway of the tent of meeting. When Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he arose from the midst of the congregation and took a spear in his hand and went after the man of Israel into the tent and pierced both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman, through the body. So the plague on the sons of Israel was checked. Those who died by the plague were 24,000. So, under Balaam's Wicked and perverse counsel, Israel was thrust into grave sexual immorality. And it was of such a pervasive and emboldened nature that it carried over into broad daylight, seeking no cover for its actions and even exceeding natural boundaries and like offenses, only being finally checked by Phineas' zeal for God. But not before how many? 24,000 people were dead from God's righteous judgment upon them. That is why Israel killed Balaam. Balaam, the false prophet, who, Peter says, is an example of the false teacher who works for the same wages to the same end for the destruction of God's people. And being as we are not Israel and therefore operate under a different economy, we do not put false teachers on trial for execution, but we do put them out of the church and we also have confidence that if the Lord exercise righteous judgment against the angels who sinned in their engagement of sexual offenses with women before the flood, and if the Lord exercise righteous judgment against Noah's unbelieving generation, and if the Lord exercise righteous judgment against, this, uh, the, against Sodom and Gomorrah, then, what is the testimony of Peter? The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trial and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who go after the flesh and its corrupt lust and despise authority. And so here we are, examining this second characteristic and expression of conduct by the false teacher. Namely, they're going after the flesh and its corrupt lust. The element was first in the listed order provided in verse 10, but second in Peter's treatment of these two major identifiers of the false teacher's character and conduct. The other one being their despising of authority, which, as we worked through last week, was expressed in their profoundly arrogant blaspheming of fallen angels, courses of action that should have brought them to the, point, uh, to the place of trembling, 
even as uh, angels do not so engage their fallen counterparts, which is in part why Peter speaks about them in, in such severe language. Um, and then picking up with verse 12, this next section will be the second what of the second half of this chapter, addressing their corrupt lust expressed in their pursuit of unrighteous wages, hearts and conduct that put them in the profane company of Balaam. So let's read our primary passage now. We're going to back up to verse 10 for context and finishing through verse 16. Peter writes of the false teacher, They're daring, self-willed. They do not tremble when they blaspheme glorious ones, whereas angels who are greater in strength and power do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like unreasoning animals born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, blaspheming where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed, suffering unrighteousness as the wages of their unrighteousness, considering it a pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions as they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and unceasing sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed. They are accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he received a rebuke for his own lawlessness. For a mute donkey, speaking out with the voice of a man, restrained the madness of the prophet. So verse 12, again, But these, like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct, to be captured and killed, blaspheming where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed. Peter begins here by firmly contrasting the false teachers with holy angels, expressing the arrogance of the actions of the false teacher, and they're conducting themselves in a manner that exceeds the boundaries of their rightful place. And they're doing what holy angels, who are greater in strength and power, do not do. And with this, he impacts um, what this says of the false teacher's person and character. That in contrast to the conduct of the superior angels, that these men are like unreasoning animals. Their conduct has no rational, sensible tethering to it. They're ignorant, they're impulsive, they're driven by carnal passions of pride and greed and lust. Their sins have driven them to the, to the base simplicity of animals. And, without, and I would say with intentional irony, Peter draws out that a stubborn donkey had more clarity and more sense than her money-loving perverse master, who presumed he could work around Yahweh's clear command to him, but who, unlike his donkey, was prepared to walk right into death, which proved to be his outcome, as he persisted, even after correction, to pursue his base instincts of craving over the clarity of consequences. And as Peter goes on to state, they are just like him. They're just like him. They've taken the same path. They are in over their heads and are none the wiser about it. And it will produce their destruction, which is their sure outcome. And regarding this matter of uh, destruction, I want you to see that it's just that, destruction. A destruction that accompanies them and that will consume them. And we've seen, them, uh, we've seen this from the very introduction. They introduced what? Destructive heresies and have, count, uh, and have courted swift destruction for themselves. So that's the nature of their character and it's the nature of their outcome. But false prophets also <coughs> arose among the people just as there will also be false teachers among you, the church, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves, introducing destructive heresies, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Do you hear Peter's clear emphasis here? They breed destruction, they foster destruction, and they will suffer destruction. Now, with this in view, do you remember the if-then of judgment and preservation? It was a number of weeks ago, but do you remember the if-then of judgment and preservation that we worked through in chapter 2, verses 4 through 10? Well, with that, it was the false teacher's destruction and short judgment that touched Peter's argument off, and from which the whole of the argument was really developed. 
um, as observed by the statements that immediately precede and follow the judgment intensive portion of the chapter. So we have that cluster of judgment, judgment, judgment. So let's look at what preceded it and what followed it. So it begins with, their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. That's explicitly about the false teacher, and it ends with, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trial and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who go after the flesh and its corrupt lust and despise authority. So it is destruction that will lead to judgment. That is the fruit and finish of the false teacher. The antithesis to your calling, which is to have a, a life that is filled and finished in righteousness. We read, as obedient children, do not be as, as obedient children, not being conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all of your conduct, because it is written, You shall be a holy, for I am holy. Now, Peter is really hard on these folks especially here in verse 12, uh, referring to them as senseless animals that exist only to perish, either by way of other creatures, by themselves, or under the dinner plate. They, they are designed to, be, to die. They're designed to be killed. And for the false teacher, this may or may not be a destruction in their present experiences of this life. A lot of them do have severe destruction in the wake of their natural lives, but it will most certainly be a full and final destruction in God's righteous judgment, a judgment that will consume the very ones they are blaspheming, namely fallen angels, and will go on to consume them as well. As Peter states, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant will also be destroyed in their destruction. So, as we've worked to make clear, uh, they are arrogant slaves of corruption and are none the wiser for assuming actions that even angels will not take and in such they are blaspheming where they have no knowledge where they are unaware where they are ignorant and they will be destroyed suffering wrong for doing wrong and then Peter continues in verse 13 and 14 suffering unrighteousness as the wages of their unrighteousness Considering it a pleasure to revel in the daytime, their stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions as they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and unceasing sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, they are accursed children. So just as their destruction produces destruction, so does their harmful and unrighteous wrongs produce harmful and unrighteous wrongs. Matters that Peter speaks to here considering it a pleasure to revel in the daytime, reveling in their deceptions amidst true believers and having appetites for adultery and unceasing sin. So let's consider these matters for a moment, reveling in the daytime. Well, at the minimal, this would be antithetical to the, the productive calling of the day, expressing loose or unrighteous living. And Jesus stated in John chapter 9, We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. And Paul paints this picture of the nature of night even more emphatically in Romans chapter 13. The night is almost gone and the day is at hand. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but... Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh in regard to its lust. Now, I can pause here to state the obvious. Peter's not excusing the night for the time for bad behavior. That, well, they should do this at nighttime, and boy, they're doing it in the daytime. And don't they understand there's an order to these things? Rather, he was expressing how shockingly brazen how shockingly brazen the patterns of carnal activities are for the false teacher. It even fills their days. And we say this recognizing again that the night was and still is a, is a time commonly associated with, with baser courses of action. Again, the Apostle Paul, this time writing to the Thessalonians, says, For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. This is a, a, this is a reason the, a, a, why a lot of law enforcement officers enjoy working the night shift. Because a lot of time the day shift, it's boring. It's just regular, decent folks telling you about their problems and needing help. But the nighttime, 
it's the folks that aren't in bed, that aren't home, that aren't where they should be. And, and now you're going to get some the, the lower, the baser actions of men, and you can, you can put a stop to it. You can address true evildoers. Now, they come out in the daytime as well, but it's more natural context in the night. And then we think back to Israel's vulgar conduct at, at Peor and the climax of that event. Remember back in Numbers chapter 25, when a man of the land, um, excuse me, when a man took a, a woman of the land into his tent in broad daylight before everybody, there was no shame or hiding this. The, the people were weeping at the tent of meeting. Lord's just given the, the death order, and he trumps off with some lady, and not in a proper context. And such is the extraordinary nature of the false teacher as they have forgotten even the reasonable parameters of their offenses. They're carousing in the day. And after expressing this brazen indifference of conduct, Peter appears to just fire off. He's, he's kind of had enough. They're stains and blemishes. This is what they are. They're, they're disgusting. It's an eruption of disgust that Peter gives a concise but fitting identification of these offenders. And he's not just losing his cool, he's had enough with those who are so brazen in their offense and assault of Christ's church. They are the very antithesis also of Christ and his bride. Christ, the how is Christ identified by Peter, the spotless lamb and his bride, whom he will bring to a place of final and complete purity, herself without spot or wrinkle. But these false teachers are stains and blemishes these are incidental and natural imperfections. You know, stains happen. You Sometimes you, you can identify the, the age and experience of certain clothing because it's been through some stuff. It's had things dropped on it, spilled on it, and otherwise that happens. But now it's not quite what it was. So incidental and natural imperfections, something that it's solely a garment or, or, or purpose or a person, maybe the imperfections as it were. These things are common for this life, right? It happens. But it's not common in the identification of the people that have been called to holiness and that rightfully are identified as being in Christ. I'm not saying you don't spill things on your shirt. I am saying that what is common experience is not common acts of the Spirit in terms of holiness and lives of purity and lives of faithfulness. But such is common for those who are false teachers. They're stains and blemishes. But we've been called to something better. So you have Christ purifying and Christ cleansing his church. And by contrast, the nature and the conduct of the false teacher is one that would see the public testimony of the church sullied through the seduction of weak persons and the maligning of truth. So they would seek to spoil, to ruin, to tarnish. And as to be expected, they pursue this course of conduct by means of deception, which proves to be a great pleasure or satisfaction for them. Their distorting of words and truth and acts of service, repurposing them to their carnal ends. Offenses woven into the, and this is why it's even more offensive, repurposing words and truth and conduct not just in general experiences in life. There's plenty of cons and plenty of wicked people out there, but this is, these are offenses that are woven into the precious body life of the true church. You see why this is especially offensive? Notably, again, in the, the context, Peter says, of the fellowship meals, otherwise expressed as love feasts that were a common expression of unity and, and love within the early church. So you have these profound offenses but then Peter goes on to state their eyes are full of, the, of, of, the, of adultery, of their adulterous woman, and unceasing sin. It actually is eyes full of adultery, but more plainly, it's eyes full of the adulteress. Eyes being a way of expressing a vantage point or a perspective as they're the most immediate and comprehensive way that we, we take in and perceive our, way, our world, right? We see in Matthew 20, through the medium of a, a parable, a master asked one who labored for him, is your eye envious because I'm generous? Well, the worker, he's not asking, do you have a condition of the eye in which it, it takes on its own valuation and desires of the world? That's weird. And he's asking, your perception, is it envious? <laughs> so by its function, the eye or, or vision serves as a representation of one's perspective and thereby our engagement with the world. And so here the false teacher's eyes are said to be full of adultery or sexual infidelity. Not in a manner uh, or of the nature where they're, they're feeling the tug of temptation and they're, they're struggling to, to maintain 
holiness in all things and in all contexts, but or even a drifting toward carnal desires. But this is a full saturation of appetite. This is what they desire, and this is what marks them. They're not Lady Folly's victim. They're her accomplice. And there's a big difference on that one. They're literally having a view of women not as persons, but as objects to exploit in sexual improprieties. Not seeing women as... as uh, fellow heirs or as just women in general, but as opportunities. It is a full-on saturation of perversion that has consumed them and their engagements of this world. Therefore, they are so engrossed in their drive to sin, they are unceasing in it. Sin is to the false teacher what prayer is to the true believer, something that marks our days and lives. That which is both planned and drifted into, it's because it's who we are. You might catch yourself just, you're not formally praying, but you find yourself, you're just talking to the Lord, asking for help or giving thanks or, or expressing certain, certain things. Well, the counterpart to that is the, the false teacher who, that's their relationship with sin. They are consumed with it. And just to drive this distinction home even more firmly, let's note how Peter has addressed the matter of sin in his letters. He speaks to sin in relation to Christ who died for the sins of his beloved, that we might be redeemed in ourselves, not continue in sin. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 to 24. For to this you have been called, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps, who did no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, who being reviled was not reviling in return. While suffering, he was uttering no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in, the, in his body on the tree, so that having died to sin, we might live to righteousness." By his wounds were healed. First uh, Peter 3.18 For Christ also suffered for sins, once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, so that he might bring you to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. And then First Peter 4.1-2 Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to no longer live the rest of the time in the flesh, nor for the lust of men, but for the will of God. So in view of this, and the minimal, in view of these three passages, where is the compatibility of our righteous suffering that directs us to a life submitted to the will of God with the conduct of these persons who are reveling in the day, stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions, and have eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin? There's no compatibility there, is there? Peter says Christ suffered for sin that you won't sin. Christ gave an example. Don't sin. Christ expects you to walk in holiness. And yet they are consumed with these things, and this under the banner of Christ and his church. There's no association in these matters. Though no matter of association with those who revel in the day, their stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions, eyes full of adultery, never ceasing from sin. There's no compatibility or place for them amongst Christ's church. Yet, They've integrated and infiltrated the church by means of deception with an aim for destruction, shame, and death. And among their vulgar means and conduct is the enticement of unstable souls, a seducing and slaying of the weak, as though they are capturing prey with, with crafty bait. The, the language here is actually like a fishing lure, drawing them in, custom selected for those with unstable souls. And we know the weight of the assault here. We know the danger. We know the, 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 the hard challenges that are already present that, that fleshly lust must be abstained from as its weight is it what wages war against the soul. We know that already. And that we, we know the, the nature of the burden of living in challenging contexts. Lot, who resided in a horribly perverse city, had his righteous soul tormented by what surrounded him. So it's no wonder that those who would secretly introduce destructive heresies would also be those who would entice, seduce, and draw away the weak. It's hard already to be faithful in holiness. And so what do they do? They go after, they infiltrate, they deceive, and they pursue the weak. They do this by the powerful tool of destruction, this perversion of God's good gift in the context of sexuality to God's, God, God's good gift of man framed in the context of marriage itself is a picture of union of Christ and his bride. And so it is, just as it was said of them in their introduction. 
They will not lead with the authority of truth, but by sensuality and false words. And what are they going to do? They're going to entice and draw away. And as taxing and as unpleasant as it is, it continues. Peter states it's as though they've been trained in greed. So they're already perverse and out of, out of the natural boundaries of perversity and going after those who are weak. And now he says, oh, let's describe them further. They're, they're, it's as though they've been trained in greed. They've gone to the, the gym of greed. It's actually the, the term here is like for gymnasium. They're, they're hitting the gym hard for greed. And what a peculiar and striking way to express the profundity of their being consumed with serving themselves no matter what the expense. They trained to master and better perfect that which already comes naturally so that they might be all the more skilled at their greed. Again, think about that. Their training at what already comes naturally, but that we're called to repel and mortify in our own lives. So most people outside of physical impairment, and there are contexts in which this is the case, but outside of physical impairment or really just for some of us being out of shape, most people can run, right? Classic case of this, you pull up in a parking lot and someone's crossing the parking lot and all of a sudden, I don't know why, but people are like, I'm, I'm good. And then they run. It's like, I was going to wait either way. We can run. And that's part of our natural ability. And it's a natural ability that may not be enjoyed, but most of us have that natural ability. And we know that there's also those who strive to excel in running. And that might be a little peculiar, but there are those who strive to excel in running. So what do they do? They train, right? They learn about, they learn about and work hard at running better. And they develop skill and greater excellence and success at running. That makes sense. A natural thing, you cultivate, you learn, you get better. Now, greed to our shame, also comes naturally, right? We didn't have to naturally learn how to want all the, 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 the snacks and fellowship time. It's just there. The unnatural part is restraint. It, must, it has to be mortified. The greed has to be mortified. It has to be put to death. But what is the false teacher's relationship to greed? Outside of snacks, real greed, destructive greed. It's as though they've mastered a well-honed craft. They speak, they teach, and they act for their personal gain and benefit. Now, I think of some of you, I know um, Milton in particular, that have, have given years of your life in military service, and not simply military work, but we call it service, right? You and others have forfeited time and opportunities to be part of something bigger than yourself. And that's commendable, um, and it's, uh, it's caring for a nation full of people who may or may not know anything of work, the work that was done personally, but they personally benefited as they go about their common and peaceful experiences. We're grateful, and it benefits even other nations that have benefited from those who have served in the military. Now, that's not to say that it's purely altruistic service. We don't say, oh, so-and-so served, or dad served in reserves, and I know others have served in other capacities, and it's so they've served. We don't say, well, they worked for the military. We call it service, right? Because they're genuinely giving something to someone else. They're benefiting and they're helping others. They're, they're serving. But it's not purely altruistic. Um, there are benefits to serving, aren't there? And that's fine. And usually there's a measure of personal satisfaction and joy as well. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as service is the first objective. And so it is the work of teaching, particularly in the context of the local church. It's not a work that's pursued because one is incapable or wholly disinterested at all other work. I truthfully think that mentality made the sliding in of false teachers all the more easy. When you start cultivating, well, I can't do anything else. Maybe they can teach or preach. Wow, welcome false teachers, because they will fill that vacuum. Rather, it's a work of giving oneself to others. It is studying, it is praying and preparing with a view to one's own soul first as a matter of integrity, but also and constantly with a view to God's flock that's been entrusted to the stewarding care of making God's word clear for thought and action. So how profane, and Peter would have understood this, Peter the apostle, Peter the pastor elder, how profane is the one who is disciplined and trained in greed. In some measure, studying and preparing, as many false teachers do genuinely know the scriptures. They're not idiots. And they have a measure of skill in communicating them. I'm not going to go into details, but I did have a conversation with Denise this week with 
on a whim, I don't make it a habit of listening to bad teachers, but the title caught me. I was like, well, that's interesting. I wonder what he has to say. And I was engrossed, not with the content, but with how is he walking around and just talking so clearly, so well for so long? Does he have like an earbud in? I can't imagine that. That's skill. And some of them are very skilled at that. They work very hard at that. But they're skilled in their study and their skill and their execution because they've trained and disciplined themselves with a view to themselves. Not because they dare not declare what they have not wrestled with in their own soul first, but because they are consumed with themselves and their hearers are just that. They are hearers. They are not anything but an audience. They're not sheep that are being tended to. They're not fellow believers in Christ. They are an audience that can feed the machine. An assembly of persons to be appeased for personal gain, be it for pride or money or carnal activities. Now, and again, working through these matters, I chose to peek into the shallow well. I did it, obviously, this week to, to kind of, like, just curious. He had a really bad title. I wonder what he's, I think it's the particular teacher, person, thing, whatever it would be. Um, it says, I don't know what to do. And I thought, you don't. You don't know what to do. And then it, he went on to destroy a, a, a precious text. But um, it was strange. But nevertheless, I took another peek into this uh, shallow well of some of the more well-known, I'd say, shysters who present themselves as men of God, but have cultivated their skill and greed. And I came across a video, and it wasn't some spliced-together thing. It wasn't old. It was fairly recent, and it's somebody that's well-known in their circles, and I'm going to even quote words because I think it's proper. If I'm going to criticize, I'll quote, but I'm not going to cite the quotations because I'm not citing them as authoritative, and I'm not doing it to be sensational. You want to know who it is? We can talk later. But this particular um, situation was interesting and, and heartbreaking. Uh, was, he was participating in some sort of, I'd say, profane fundraising event. And I say profane because not because he was saying gross words in terms of an overt and clear way, but it was profane that it was manipulating people with the prospect of expediting Jesus' return through the giving to his cause more faithfully and generously. Shared that with Matt, and I, I saw the jaw on Friday go, <laughs> like, what? That, that doesn't work. As though promoting some second coming lottery. Uh, throw some cash on the table. See if we can't make this happen. Those weren't his words, but that's pretty well clearly what he was communicating. And I'd say, well, he's obviously an authority on this matter as he lives in his 35,000 square foot mansion tax-free. I don't know. Maybe he's got a lot of stuff. I don't know. But that evaluation, it could be regarded as unfair. Again, um, I don't like hit pieces. I don't like hit pieces in blogs. I don't like hit pieces on vlogs, on whatever else medium they come in. So I want to be fair. So is that an unfair uh, statement about this person that you may or may not know who they are? Well, let me use his own words. And I quote, quote, I honestly believe this, that the reason Jesus hasn't come is because people haven't given the way God has told them to give. When you understand, you can speed up the time. Speed up the time of what? Christ's return. He then wanted to speak about being insulted by a man who condemned his being a millionaire. The, the man was chastising, you're a millionaire, and that's not right. To which he corrected the man that, no, he is not a millionaire. And I watched the tone inflection and everything. He's like, I told him I was not a millionaire. But put the word multi in front of it. Multi-millionaire. And then went to, on to say that, yeah, I told that guy, you mess with me, I'm going to buy your company and fire you. Wow. Well, you know, I don't see 1 Timothy 5.18 as a grounds for extortion, but as a stewardship for which I and others will give an account. This multi-millionaire is also on record for shamelessly asking his supporters to help him purchase a $54 million jet that Jesus wants for him to have so that he can preach the gospel without having to refuel. You know, like he has to do on his personal third or fourth jet that he has. When he does what? What's he doing? Well, he's going to preach the gospel. Well, okay, that's commendable. I told you I, when we were praying for Peru, I said, you know what? I have some a point of relation, some point of understanding. Even when I hear about Kichwa India, uh, the Kichwa people in the Andes Mountains, I know Kichwa people in the Andes Mountains, and it's precious to me. Well, I took a plane to get there. I understand logistics. I understand that it takes time. It takes money. But he's saying, it's, I need to do this because I need to go preach the gospel, the gospel for which him does not include original sin and is therefore not the gospel. 
He also clarified that he really believes that if Jesus were on earth today, he would not be riding a donkey. Well, the irony here is that maybe if this man traded in a few from his fleet of private jets and rode a donkey instead, he might be spared some of the folly of his own madness. But before we further consider the association of the false teacher with Balaam, we note that Peter appears to erupt with another title of disgust for these persons. He's already referred to them as stains and blemishes, and now he calls them accursed children. Not someone with a, a magic hex on them, oh, they're cursed, but someone under the righteous condemnation of God. And that is a terrifying identification that Peter does not cavalierly throw around. He doesn't say, that's it, I'm tired of you. you're, you're cursed. I bet you're cursed of God. Now he knows what he's saying here. He's saying they're under the righteous judgment of God. And that brings us full circle and back to Balaam. In verse 15 and 16, Peter writes, Forsaking the right way, they've gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but he received a rebuke for his lawlessness. For a mute donkey, speaking out with the voice of a man, restrained the madness of the prophet. And here we need to double back to an extremely important element of the false teacher, one that we've already begun getting a view to earlier in this chapter, where it was stated, even denying the master who bought them. We saw that in chapter 2, verse 1. And here, as forsaking the right way, they've gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the false prophet. Now, when the chapter opened, there was a, a clear association between the false prophet of old and the false teacher now. And here there's an explicit connection to one in particular, namely Balaam, not the man with the talking donkey, but the man whose donkey's mouth was opened to preserve him from the immediate consequences of death for angering Yahweh, that Balaam. Also the man who Israel struck down after he conspired for their moral compromise, which led to the loss of 24,000 of their people. And again, can you imagine that? The, being a major really probably the principal contributing factor to the death of 24,000 people. So I want you to think about something today. You're going to drive home. You'll leave here. And you're welcome to stay. We have restrooms. We have kitchen. I've had to sleep here before, not because of anything at home. The fire alarm wouldn't stop going off and there was a leak in the roof. But you'll go home today. And I want you, as you leave the Fairburn area, think about Fairburn, Georgia. This is where the Lord has providentially placed our local church, and it's a city of less than 19,000 people. We need to feel the weight of the offense of Balaam, because Balaam is a precursor, an example of the contemporary false teacher. 24,000 people. This city doesn't have but 19,000 people. That is a lot of people. Balaam, who loved neither the Lord nor his neighbor, but the wages of unrighteousness, and we have seen the choice of going the way of Balaam. It may not cost 24,000 souls in one day, but it is destroying people. You understand that? And it's one, so we've seen those who, they're going the choice, they're, they're, they've gone the way of Balaam, being trained in greed, having eyes full of adultery, and a way and path that precludes another way, another path. You can't be on these two paths at the same time, namely the path of righteousness that might send one through suffering and struggling, but as a path accompanied by the good shepherd and one that ends in reward. But the false teacher is choosing the way of Balaam that has rejected, has abandoned, has left the way of Christ. That is what forsaken requires, a prior relationship or association. And this is not the language of the skeptic or even the pagan. This is the language one formally associated with, formally identified with Christ in his church. It's the language of apostasy. But unlike the common apostate, the false teacher maintains the appearance of continued relationship. They're not one that says, I reject Christ and everything he has to say. They are functionally rejecting Christ and everything he has to say, but they're staying within the church so as to spread the tentacles of their carnal and profane impact to not only the ruin of their souls, but to the ruin of others. And not just anybody, but they're going after the weak and the fragile so they can pervert and persuade. But the problem is there's no donkey that's averting their path to destruction. Their madness goes unchecked outside of the, the, the church disciplining and putting them out. It goes unchecked, and, they're and in their destruction, they will be destroyed. Okay, so we've 
gone a long way, and we've uh, we're, we've been working through Second Peter two for a while now. And even twelve through sixteen, um, it's taxing. So we're gonna. This is a good stopping point. But Peter hasn't finished. We have. Peter hasn't. You might be like, boy, Peter's a fiery one. Well, reasonably so. Um, so was it uh, Friday? The, the the glass break. Um, I was here in my study, working away, working on this, and I hear glass breaking. And so I dutifully grab my hammer and approach the noise. Declare calling out that I'm armed, you need to leave or identify yourself. I didn't know. But it was game on at that point in time. If I was out walking the streets and I heard glass break, I'd be like, that sounds unfortunate. Something dro somebody dropped something. Maybe if I'm in a restaurant, glass breaks, like, oh, it's going to come out of somebody's paycheck. But it was here, the church. And what was my responsibility? Was it to be like, oh, I hope somebody doesn't come in and do something terrible. That would be unfortunate. No, it was defense mode now. We have to understand the nature of what they're doing. Peter's fired up because he's hearing windows getting busted out. It wasn't ornaments falling. It was windows being busted out, and they're coming in to assault Christ church. So yeah, he's fired up, and he has more to say. We're going to pause here, and short of the unforeseen, we're going to pick up with verse 17 next week. And we'll continue our development of the fuller picture of the false teacher, a work that can be, again, quite grim. But with this, what I tried to do even today was pepper in some, some contrast with the genuine believer to provide you some refreshment of what is good. I don't want you to just bog down with these folks. I want you to remember who you are. And that, and, and to, to think about who those who hold the labor, the, uh, to hold the line and labor and, and faithfulness. And that's you, the true and faithful church. But these are hard things, and we have a responsibility to speak to these subjects. Uh, for the elders, it's a qualifying expectation that we oppose false teachers. Some people really enjoy that. It becomes almost a hobby. Let's, ah, let's go after these guys. It's part of the charge. It's a qualification of the eldership that, that, we, that we address and oppose false teachers and false teaching. But for the church as a whole, it's a qualifying expectation that we stay steadfast. Right? So let's finish with... This closing exhortation from Peter who wrote that we might, what? Know, we might grow, and we might stay. And he finishes his letter, and we'll finish our time with this as a refresher, and eventually we'll get to this. But he writes to us, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard, lest you, having been carried away by the error of unprincipled men, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. All right, let's pray. Lord, we don't always have the, the understanding or capacity to understand why the apostles could write so uh, with a confidence that there would be those who would come in to seek to do harm and destruction to your church. We know that it's well within the scope of your ability to, to have ever uh, to have preserved that dynamic. Um, but we also recognize it's part of being in a fallen world, and it's the unfolding of your plans and purposes, and it, it magnifies, among other things, your keeping of those who are true, your opposing of wickedness. But it does introduce challenges. It means that we, we don't have the luxury, if, if it could be so referenced, to exclusively give attention to the nurture and care and commands and things that we want to do, and that we struggle to do. We also have to be mindful that our adversary has little minions that would come in and mix amongst us. And Lord, we, if, if nothing else, we're put in a place like David was time and time and time again that we have to just cry out to you. Would you preserve? Would you keep? Would you help? And so, Lord, we do pray. Would you preserve? Would you keep? Would you help your church? We're mindful of that on the, the large scale. but We're especially mindful of it here. We know that uh, there's a familiarity with one another and it's it's easy to identify a guest, and certainly it would be easy to identify someone up to no good at this point in the life of the body, but what would we do about it? What are we doing with our own sin? What are we doing with things that we need to wrestle with ourselves? 
much less threats that come in. So Lord, have mercy. Please preserve the integrity and the testimony of Grace Bible Church. Um, we don't know what that's going to look like tomorrow, much less years down the road, but we pray, Lord, that you would be merciful. We know no small part of that is in our joyfully, vigorously submitting to uh, the commands that you've called us to, uh, to include loving you, lives of holiness, longing for your return, and loving one another. So, Lord, we pray, preserve and have mercy. And for those who would be weak, help us to strengthen them, that they wouldn't be vulnerable. And help us to be resolved to engage a threat when necessary. And we want to also thank you that um, while threats may come, and they may do harm, and they may hurt our reputation, and they have hurt the reputation of others, their judgment is not idle, and it's not asleep. And you will do justly. Abram, Abraham was asking, will not the Lord of all the earth deal justly? And you will. He knew that, and so do we. So we pray, Lord, uh, come quickly, have mercy, and make much of your name, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.